It's time to kick ass and chew bubble gum. And I'm all out of gum. Oh boy, you saw it coming, guys. Duke Nukem 3D, one of the best games ever made in the 90s. Alongside GT2, Doom, Spyro, and Crash Bandicoot 2. Duke Nukem 3D holds a special place in my heart. Around 2006, 10 years after their debut release, I was downloading some old school games on my old PC during the summer, until I came across an interesting game called Duke Nukem 3D, a game that caused me to become the video gamer that I am today. When I first saw this, I was impressed not by the old graphics, but because of the atmosphere. It got me interested. I installed the game, and holy moly, it was an experience I don't regret. It was an awesome experience. The gameplay was awesome, the music was top-notch, and the graphics were jaw-dropping. However, these will be explained later in the review. Anyways, Duke Nukem 3D was created by 3D Realm, formerly known as Apogee Software, who, prior to Duke Nukem 3D, they made Blake Stone Aliens of Gold and Bion Menace, and also Duke Nukem and Duke Nukem 2. The game was produced by Greg Malone and George Brossard, and the game was released on April 24, 1996, and it was very well received critically and commercially, becoming one of the best games ever made. So, in case you're wondering why Duke Nukem 3D is one of the best games I ever played, find out in this review. Before we start, make sure to subscribe and click the bell notification to receive more updates, and make sure to hit the like button. Anyways, let's start the review. Duke Nukem 3D's story takes place after the events of Duke Nukem 2. After defeating the Raja Latins, Duke Nukem returns to Earth, only to find out that the Earth is invaded by aliens. He finds out that the aliens have invaded the ALA, and the LPV has mutated to pigs. Duke's ship gets shot by the aliens, and the only thing that Duke says in this situation is... Damn, those alien bastards are gonna pay for shooting up my ride. And so it begins, with explosions, gunshots, bloodshed, and lots of babes. Tons of babes. Duke Nukem 3D's gameplay is pretty similar to the other old-school FPS games. I mean, you kill enemies, collect keys, finish the level... However, Duke Nukem 3D's gameplay steps up a notch a lot by having lots of interactions such as open real doors, play some snooker, drinking water, watch some surveillance screens, telephones, toilets that can restore your health, turning on and off light switches, you name it. Like, you couldn't do that in other first-person shooter games before Duke Nukem 3D. That would make Duke Nukem 3D so unique at the time, you could do almost everything. The interactions are not only Duke Nukem 3D's strong points, but so is the enemy and the weapon roster. You do have 5 stereotypical weapons you find in every old-school first-person shooter game, but they are pretty good on their own. Let's start with the pistol. In every episode, you start with the pistol and your mighty boot. Actually, the pistol is better than I expected. It's pretty good at long range and gets lower class enemies such as the laser troopers and turrets. It shot 12 consecutive bullets and after that it reloads. In my opinion, it's actually better than the pistol from Doom, because at least it's useful for some situations, like I mentioned before. Next is the shotgun. The shotgun works just as you expected. Just like the shotgun from Doom, it's pretty useful at close range, and it's useless at long range. And it's pretty powerful against pick ops, octobrains, enforcers, but there's nothing much else to say about the shotgun, so moving on. The chain gun, also known as the Ripper, is pretty powerful against hordes of enemies, like the troopers, pick ops, etc. However, like the chain gun in Doom, while it fires like no tomorrow, it consumes ammo like no one's business, so be careful. Fun fact, the weapon was originally supposed to be a plasma rifle. However, later in development, it was changed into a chain gun. Also, the weapon is based on a Soviet prior 3B Maroka. The RPG, also known as the Rocket Propelled Grenade, is a pretty powerful weapon, as it can jib most of the enemies in the game. However, just like with the rocket launcher in Doom, do not use it at close range, as the explosion will hurt the enemy as well as you. Not to mention that using the RPG when a slimer is latched to your face is overkill. Seriously, don't do it. Only noobs do it. That's a lot of damage! The pipe bomb allows the player to throw a pipe bomb and blow it at will. 
it's just as strong as the rockets, and also, there's no limit on how many pipe bombs the player can throw out before detonating. Also, the longer you hold the fire button, the further Duke Nukem will throw the bomb. On a side note, whenever I use a pipe bomb on an enemy that didn't see me, instead of getting blown to bits, they would die normally like you would kill them with a shotgun or a pistol. However, when the enemy saw me and I used the bomb, it would be blown to bits. I don't know if it's a bug or just an oversight, let me know in the comments about this. The other four weapons are pretty unique and they feel pretty distinct. Let's start with the Shrinker. The Shrinker is a weapon that well does not inflict damage whatsoever, it shrinks enemies and you can stop them. It's actually a lifesaver for me, as it is pretty useful against Fat Commanders, Battle Lords, Pro Jareds, and even low tier gods. It's also useful against yourself, because if you use the Shrinker against the Mirror, the Blast bounces back and you'll be turned into a mini Duke. For a limited amount of time, also when you're shrunk, you cannot use your weapons and also be careful because the enemy can stop you and you'll die, so be careful. The Devastator weapon is the equivalent of Doom's Plasma Rifle. It's very powerful against lots of enemies, primarily against the bosses of the game. Not to mention that it's excellent against hordes of enemies, however, it quickly burns through ammo in just a few seconds, so always keep an eye on the ammo counter when using the Devastator. The Laser Trip Bomb is honestly, in my opinion, the most useless weapon in the game. Yes, it could be used as a trap, sure, but in my experience of the game, I never used it because I had weapons that can do the job better, like the RPG and the pipe bombs. However, the only positive thing I can say about this weapon is that it's useful for safe landing. What I mean by that is that if you're falling off for a very long time and you place a bomb in the wall, you kinda levitate for a half a second, and then you land safely without taking major damage, so that's pretty cool and useful. And last but not least, the Freeze Thrower. This weapon can make enemies turn into popsicles, however, the weapon can freeze enemies until they are in break of death. Also, the ice balls can be bounced around if they hit a solid ball, but the damage they inflict against enemies is half. Also, during the development of the game, the weapon was originally supposed to be a flamethrower. Unfortunately, just like the Ripper, later during the development of the game, it was changed into a Freeze Thrower. But oddly enough, the flamethrower was resurrected when Duke Nukem 3D World Tour was released. So, unlike the plasma cannon, the flamethrower was at least revived. All things considered, I like the weapon roster in Duke Nukem 3D. At the time, the game had the most unique weapons ever seen in a video game. And some weapons like the Shrinker have returned in Duke Nukem Forever. So, at least they have a lot of recognition, and they are pretty fun to use. The enemy roster in Duke Nukem 3D isn't too shabby either. They may be easy to take them down, but they are no pushovers whatsoever. The Lizard Troopers are the low-class enemies in the game. They have laser guns as their weapon to attack you, they can also fly using their jetpacks. When they die, they drop ammo for the pistol. Also, notice this death animation. This death animation means that the enemy is dropping dead, meaning they can attack you from behind. Luckily, they only have 1 HP, so they are pretty easy to kill. Same thing goes for the Assault Captains. The Assault Captains look pretty similar to the Lizard Troopers. However, their suit color is red, and unlike the Lizard Troopers, they can teleport and ambush you. So keep your eyes on them if they teleport. One funny thing that I saw is that if I dealt enough damage to an Assault Captain or a Lizard Trooper, when they teleport, they instantly die or get jipped, if you use the RPG after he teleports. I find it hilarious. The Pick Cop is the most iconic enemy in the entire franchise, appearing in every Duke Nukem game after Duke Nukem 3D. These mutated cops can attack you with their shotgun and they can deal pretty heavy damage if you are in close range against them. If they die, they can sometimes drop either a shotgun or in use armor. They can also sometimes ride a flying vehicle named Recon Patrol Vehicle. It's pretty agile, but it's easy to take down if you have the shotgun or the shade gun. Using the RPG is not very useful as the vehicle can dodge these rockets with ease. The Octobrain is one hell of a menacing enemy. It can levitate and fly anywhere. It attacks in two ways. First, it fires a psychic blast on you, but it's pretty easy to dodge as it needs to charge up its attack. Second, it attacks you by biting you with its vicious mouth, but just like with its psychic blast, it's pretty easy to avoid its vicious bite if you know what you're doing. Fun fact, even though an Octobrain can survive a blast from a pipe bomb, and rarely a blast from a rocket, it's pretty vulnerable against a Devastator weapon, as it only takes one mini rocket to kill. 
Now, that's weird because the pink cop and the enforcer takes 3 to 4 mini rockets to kill. The octobrain only takes 1 mini rocket. Some people say that because the pink cop and the enforcer have armor, so that makes sense that they take more mini rockets. But the octobrain has 175 HP, whereas the pink cop and the enforcer both have 100 HP. So, in my opinion, I feel like it's more of an oversight, but let me know in the comments below. The enforcer is the alternative to the pink cop, and it appears in the second episode of the game. It's pretty agile, not to mention it has a deadly chain gun, and while it's not very dangerous to take it down, when they are in groups, they can be the worst enemy. Also, they can spit acid, which is pretty harmful against Duke Nukem. The protozoid Slimer, this green little blob, can latch to your face and drain your health. However, they are pretty easy to take down, as one mighty boot can kill it. Also, the Slimer hatch from the eggs, so if you've seen a protozoid egg, use the rockets or the pipe bombs to abort them. You leave me alone! If I leave me alone! Leave! Leave me alone! Leave me alone! Leave me alone! Leave me alone! Stupid! Idiota! The Sentry Drone is one of the most annoying enemies in the entire game. Imagine Lost Soul, which was already an annoying enemy in Doom, adding an ability to explode when you are near him. Also, they come in packs, especially in the second episode. Your best bet is to use the shotgun or the shank gun. Don't use the RPG, as they will avoid it and they are also pretty agile. The Sentry Drone was originally intended to be an armed snakehead, as some of the sound files are affiliated with the word snack. Not to mention there's a some concept art for the snake head, as well in the beta version of the game, programming for the snake head to exist, but it's non-existent in the final version of the game. And finally, the Fat Commander. This big chungus of an alien can fire rockets from his anus. Yep, you heard that right, it fires rockets from its butthole. And while its rockets are nowhere near as powerful as the RPG, they are still pretty dangerous. Not only that, he can spin and slashing the player. Its main weakness is the Shrinker, and while the Freeze Thrower and the RPG are powerful, the Shrinker is much more useful as it not only shrinks the fat boy, but also gives you the chance to squash him without wasting ammo. The game has one boss in each episode, and are as follows. Battle Lord is the boss of the first episode, LA Meltdown. He has a big teeth, a big armor, a big chain gun, and most importantly, the scariest war ever seen in the video game. <laughs> Who said that? Who the fuck said that? Out of the four bosses in the game, the Battle Lord is the most dangerous in the game. Due to his chain gun being powerful and causing significant damage to the player, not to mention he also wields a mortar launcher that fires mortars and they'll remain on the ground if they don't kill Duke Nukem. Your best bet is to use the RPG, since in the first episode, you don't get the Devastator weapon. In the later episodes, you come across the smaller version of the Battle Lord, the Battle Lord Sentry. It's smaller and it has less health points than its boss version. And unlike its boss version, the smaller version of the Battle Lord is vulnerable to the Shrinker, but only if you aim on his left foot, since its sprite is taller than the other enemies. The Overlord is the boss of the second episode, Lunar Apocalypse, and it's very easy to take him down, if you know how to circle straight. He wields two rocket launchers and its rockets are just as powerful as the rockets from the RPG. In the cover art of the game, a prototype version of the boss can be seen in the cover art. It's pretty similar to the final version of the Overlord, but it has two turrets placed on its lower body. The Cycloid Emperor is the boss of the third episode, Sharpnel City. And as the final boss of the original version of the game, sadly he is a push over to be honest. Even if you start only with your pistol, it's still pretty easy to kill him. Anyways, he can attack you by either shooting mini rockets, which are just as powerful as the RPG, or blasting some psychic blast on you. All the bosses are immune to the Shrinker, not to mention that since they are pretty big, they can crush the player if he stays pretty close to the boss. Also, when you defeat a boss, you get a cutscene. They are pretty hilarious, and they can speak for themselves.
while when Duke Nukem said he would rip its head shit under his neck, he really meant it. Overall, the enemy roster in Duke Nukem 3D is pretty good and diverse. Granted, the bosses are pretty easy to defeat, but the rest of the roster are no pushovers, and they can pose a threat. Their designs are pretty good, and most of them, if not most of them, do return in later Duke Nukem games. 3D Realms released an expansion pack for Duke Nukem 3D titled Plutonium Pack in November 1996, which includes a new episode The Birth, in which Duke Nukem finds out that the woman is giving birth to a new monster, and Duke Nukem once again will destroy not only the new aliens, but also the alien queen. The expansion pack also adds one new weapon to the arsenal, the Microwave Expander. This weapon, as the name implies, it makes the enemy grow in size and then explode. It's a pretty interesting weapon to use, especially against lizard troopers and captains. One downside to the weapon is that the ammo capacity is pretty limited, making the usage of the weapon pretty limited. It's not just the weapon roster was expanded, but also the enemy roster. The expansion pack added two new enemies to the gunfight, three if you count the alien queen. The Protector Drone is one of the new enemies you encounter in the fourth episode. It's pretty fast, it slashes pretty hard, and it can also shrink you. However, while it's pretty menacing, it also has some weaknesses, such that after he tries to slash you, it stands still for a while, and it gives the player a chance to attack him. Also, the chain gun and the freeze thrower are pretty effective against them. Next up, we have the Pig Cop Tank. People say that this new enemy is pretty dangerous, but what if I told you that the Pig Cop Tank has a major weakness? You what? On its back, it has a button. That button is a self-destruct button. This is pretty useful, since it saves a lot of ammo. Be careful though, as you need to run fast to avoid explosion damage. When the tank is destroyed, there's a chance that the pilot survives at full health, so be prepared. And last but not least, the Alien Queen. This boss, alongside with the Battle Lord, is one of the toughest bosses in the entire game. She has two methods of attack. First, she can electrocute you, even if you're not in the water. Which doesn't make any sense, because you think that if you're outside of the water, you wouldn't take damage, but no, this could be a programming bug, but who knows. Anyway, its second attack is to spawn more protector drones, and launch them into battle against Duke Nukem. This makes using the RPG or the Devastator weapon against the Queen more difficult, since the protector drones jump around the battlefield, and using the RPG against them at close range is pretty dangerous, so try to move to a safer place so that you use it against the Queen, and just like the other bosses in the game, she could also squash the player if he sends too close against the Queen. All in all, the new enemy and weapon roster of the expansion pack are pretty good. The new enemies are much deadlier than the other enemies, and the micro expander is pretty fun to use. The game also has items like the night vision goggles, which amplifies all ambient light levels. However, in my experience, I've never used them because I prefer to go to darker levels without using them, otherwise using them would break the atmosphere and the creepiness of that level. The portable medkit is pretty useful, especially if you are in low health and you can find stim packs or medkits, and it's pretty versatile and convenient. If you see a portable kit, pick it, otherwise you're gonna have a bad time, especially against the Battle Lord. The Hollow Duke, while decent in multiplayer matches, it's pretty useless in the single player campaign. Since the enemies will always attack you, no matter if the Hollow Duke was turned on or off, so avoid the Hollow Duke at all costs. The steroids are pretty situational. It doubles the player's speed, making Duke Duke run faster than the Blue Hedgehog, and also multiplies Mighty Boots damage by 4. In my experience, I barely use them, but they are pretty useful for speed running, so at least it has some functionality, I guess. The protective boots is self-explanatory. It protects from hazards like acid, lava, and purple acid found in the fourth episode of the game. The scuba gear is useful for navigating underwater and preventing you from drowning. And the best inventory in the game, the jetpack. This item is the most useful thing ever in the game, as it lets you fly anywhere and reach secret places that you couldn't reach in normal ways. Hell, in some levels like Fusion Station, you can skip the entire level by using the jetpack, and let's be honest, that level was pretty boring in my opinion. Duke Nukem 3D controls pretty well. You could jump, run, and crouch, something you couldn't do in FPS games prior to Duke Nukem 3D. I mean, you could run, but never jump and crouch, and you also had mouse aiming, which was a godsend at the time. The gunplay in Duke Duke 3D is excellent. It feels like you're a badass when you use these weapons, and killing the bad guys always feels pretty rewarding. The level design in Duke Duke 3D is outstanding and versatile. All the levels in the game are non-linear and pretty large, and at the time, the levels were pretty realistic at the time. Especially on the city levels like Bankroll movie set, made Doom 2 city levels look like dog shit. 
for the first episode, LA Meltdown, has pretty diverse levels, like desert streets, strip clubs, prisons, a wasteland facility, a lunch facility, and of course the Battle Lord's Lair. For a shareware episode, it's pretty versatile. Most of the levels were created by Ellen H. Blum III, and the fifth level created by Richard Bailey Gray, also known as the Level Lord. The second episode, Lunar Apocalypse, my favorite episode by the way, takes place in outer space and Duke Dukin must explore spacecrafts, space stations, and exploring the boot base. In my opinion, I consider this episode my absolute favorite because of the atmosphere and how majestic it is. I mean like, holy fucking shit, at the time it was amazing to explore the space stations, the moon base. It looked pretty realistic and pretty creepy at the time, especially on later levels like Lunar Reactor and Dark Side. These levels were, and are still to this day, badass in every way, shape, or form. They are challenging, creepy, gloomy, and most importantly, they have badass music, but I'll get to that later. All the levels of the second episode were once again created by both Alan H. Blum III and Richard Bailey Gray, also known as the Level Lord. The third episode, Chardonnay City, isn't too shabby either. It's my second favorite out of the four episodes in the game. In this episode, you go through to a sushi bar, bang, flooded buildings, a movie set, a subway, a freaking hotel of all things, and of course a stadium. They are pretty challenging if you don't know what you're doing, not to mention some levels like raw meat. FUCKING RAW! You have to do some backtracking. The levels look pretty realistic at the time. I mean, when compared to Doom 2 City levels, Duke Duke 3D City levels, the difference is fucking day and night. The levels were mostly created by Levin Lord himself and Ellen Blum III. The fourth episode, The Birth, which is only available on the Atomic Edition, Duke Nukem goes through a secret mission facility, which is actually a reference to the Mission Impossible film series. This tape will self-destruct in one second. A fast food restaurant, a shopping mall of all things, a theme park, a post office, a ship, and even Area 51 for all you mean freaks out there. These levels are much harder than the other levels. New enemies like the protector drones and the pig tanks, as well as the alien queen herself. But if you master the skills of the game, you probably beat this episode with ease. The levels were designed by George Browser, Keith Shuttler, Level Lord, Ellen Blue Third, and of course, Randy Burchard. All the levels have tons of secrets to be found. Even some of the secrets have reference to other films, music, and even games. We meet again, Dr. Joe. Terminated. Hmm, looks like I have the con. Now, this is a force to be reckoned with. Especially in the third level of this first episode, you come across a dead Doom Marine. Well, I mean, at the time, Doom 3D put Doom to shame, but nowadays, I wonder who got the last laugh. That's one Doom Space Marine. The babes aren't the only thing alive in the game, and most of them are in cases like pods. And you think you can save them, but no, at least not in an original version, because in the N64 version you can save them. However, do not kill them, because doing so will cause to spawn more enemies, making your day job much harder than usual, so be careful to not use the RPG in this situation. And the way to get key cards is more than just find a place and get it. Some of them involve you around completing a puzzle, such as clicking the right switches to unlock other areas, or getting a new key card. So it has more variety than in Doom and Doom 2. One thing that kinda annoyed me in this game is that rarely I would splash for no apparent reason. As you can see, when I tried to obtain these rockets in that secret area, I would get squashed for no reason. I heard that it's a build engine flaw, maybe from the footage that you're seeing, maybe I went too fast, so fast that I might alter dimensions when I went there, but at the end I died. Another thing that it's actually a happy accident for me was when I was in the auto-destruct sequence animation, and if an enemy killed me during that sequence, the next level I would start at full health without losing any weapons or inventory. It's like the game is nice to you, and it says, So, you died during that sequence? Don't worry, in the next level you start with full health with your weapons intact, so don't worry kid, keep playing. So, at least the game is being generous for me. Did I mention that I like this game? Moving on. The difficulty in Duke Duke and 3D is pretty hard. However, in my 13 years of experience playing the game, I find the game to be pretty easy, even on Comgate some mode, since I know the enemy pattern, the secrets, and what weapons to use. However, newcomers should play on Let's Rock so that they can learn the enemy mechanics, how the weapons work, and explore every nook and cranny of every level in the game. If you're a Duke Wizard, you can play on Damn I'm Good mode. Damn I'm Good. 
This skill level isn't as dreadful as the Nightmare skill level in Doom and Doom 2, but it's still damn hard as rocks. Just like with the Nightmare mode in Doom and Doom 2, when the enemies die, they respawn. However, they don't attack fast, and also if you jib them with the RPG, they don't respawn. But it's still pretty tedious, and you're gonna waste a lot of rockets to do so. So in my experience, I didn't like that skill level at all. Duke Nukem 3D runs on a great engine called the Build Engine, which was created by Ken Silverman. It was used on some games like Shadow Warrior, Blood, and of course, Duke Nukem 3D itself. And these games push the engine to its limits. At first, the engine is pretty identical to Doom's engine, but it has a lot of features that the Doom engine didn't have, like higher resolutions, voxels with the feature in Shadow Warrior and Blood, rooms over rooms, and of course, sectors. The graphics in Duke Nukem 3D were, and still to this day, pretty groundbreaking at the time. Sure, it didn't have the 3D models of Quake, but the atmosphere, the attention to detail on every level, the sprites are pretty well detailed and animated, the weapon models are very well designed, the shadows and lightning effects are pretty well made, making it more more creepy scary atmosphere in sub levels, especially on the levels of the second episode of the game, like Darkseid and Incubator. The soundtrack in this game is legendary. I mean, who could forget this legendary theme? Grab Bag, composed by legendary Lee Jackson. It is one of the most iconic theme songs I ever heard in my life. It's way better than Super Mario Bros. theme song, Sonic's Green Hill Zone theme song, and even Doom's D1M1 theme song. Anyways, the entire soundtrack was composed by both Lee Jackson and, surprise surprise, Bobby Prince, who also composed some music from Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, and Doom 2. Themes such as Alien Savior Prayers, Plasma, Space Storm, and Lemon Chill are my personal favorites. They pump so much adrenaline to the levels, and in my opinion they are the best themes in the entire game. That's not to say the rest of the soundtrack is bad, the rest of it is pretty damn good. The sound design is pretty good as well. The ambient sounds were pretty realistic at the time, as well as the weapon sounds that are so great to hear. Just listen. Save this section of this review the best for last. The character himself, Duke Nukem. I'm Duke Nukem, and I'm coming to get the rest of you alien bastards. This king is one of the most badass characters in the entire video game history, even more badass than Doom Guy, Mario, and Sonic combined. Just imagine Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, Bruce Willis, Bruce Campbell, and Chris Eastwood fused together, and you got this badass motherfucker that is Duke Nukem. It's not just the physical appearance and his actions that Duke was praised for, it was his mouth, and oh boy, his mouth stole the entire show in this game. Voiced by the legendary John St. John, who oddly enough was Big the Cat and E-13 Omega in the Sonic games. Most of his quotes are originated from movies in the 80s and the 90s, while some are pretty original, I mean, just here is the masterpiece of lying. Get that crap out of here. Hail to the king, baby.
Holy cow. Let God sort him out. I ain't afraid of no quake. Damn, those alien bastards are gonna pay for shooting up my ride. Yeah, piece of cake. Ugh, this sucks. I'm gonna put the smack dab on your ass. I'm gonna get medieval on your asses. Aren't his quotes fucking awesome? Anyways, he makes a lot of references, such as Star Wars, Terminator, and the Evil Dead trilogy. And most of his quotes are from Evil Dead trilogy. As a matter of fact, the cover art of the game is actually a parody of the cover art of the movie. These things that I mentioned are the reason why Duke Nukem 3D is so freaking awesome. So, what's my final verdict on Duke Nukem 3D? Well, ever since its inception, it was and still considered as one of the best games ever made, and my all-time favorite game of all time. And you guess you probably why. It has excellent gameplay that keeps the players on their toes, great weapon and enemy roster, legendary level design, amazing soundtracks, and great graphics that are even still to this day. Oh boy, it's so good. It's so good, guys. It's so good that I made a whole video reviewing this awesome game. Now, is Duke Nukem 3D the best game ever in the world? Well, it depends on your opinion. You do have Final Fantasy VII, Grand Turismo 4, Burnout 3 Takedown, Metal Gear Solid, and of course Sonic Mania. But when you think brilliance, adrenaline, badassery, guns blazing, explosions, bloodshed, and babes, you think Duke Nukem 3D. And the fact this video is as long as it is, is a testament of how awesome Duke Nukem is. Unless you play Duke Nukem forever. Game over. That's gotta hurt. Groovy. This is KTIT. KTIT. Playing the breast are the best tunes in town. Damn, I'm good. Hmm, don't have time to play with myself. Damn, I'm looking good. Shake it, baby. So help me, Duke. Gonna rip him a new one. Rockin'. Somebody's gonna friggin' pay for screwing up my vacation. After a few days of R&R, &R, I'll be ready for more action.